And so, uh, moving right along then here uh, in Rene Ganon, we'll be looking here in this video at uh, chapters it looks like here. We've got 8, 9, and 10. 8 is on ancient crafts and modern industry. 9 is on the twofold significance of anonymity. And 10 is on the illusion of statistics. Um, so the first thing I want to look at, though, uh, is this idea that Ganon has that comes through more and more clearly as the text goes along, is this idea that he has of inverse analogy, whereby for everything that is qualitative uh, and purely qualitative, something quantitative mirrors it, but poorly and imperfectly, uh, like a person looking at their image in a muddy pool of water, let's say. Um, because in his metaphysical uh, difference engine, uh, here, he's got uh, quality sort of at the top, like the Krita Yuga or the Golden Age, the absolute age in which the iconotypes and the, archa the, the archetypes uh, that will be seated all throughout the cycle predominate during that age. And then all the way at the end, which is the age that he says we're in now, the Kali Yuga, uh, we've got these originating archi in, a, in badly warped and deformed mode at the sort of bottom of the cosmic cycle. Um, which is interesting. Uh, and this idea of inverse analogy, it's a little bit like if you imagine Dante where he puts uh, Satan upside down and the three faces of Satan at the core of the earth uh, are an inverse analogy of the Trinity at the top of the universe that Dante ascends through as he goes through the planetary spheres. That's another example of inverse analogy. Uh, for everything at the top, there'll be a poor mirror, a, a shadow copy of it, like Plato at the bottom. Um, <clears throat> and so in this chapter... Chapter 8 on the craftsman versus uh, industry. We have the craftsman representing the purely qualitative mode of being in, in an essential manner. And opposite to that, we have the industrial worker, the factory worker, uh, who, in whose case the reign of quantity predominates. Uh, the factory worker could, anyone could do his job. You could just swap him out. Um, he's basically a servant of the machine. So we have the opposition also between tool and machine. The craftsman uses a tool as an extension of his being so that the products that he produces from his essence uh, outward into the world are essentially extensions of who and what he is. Not so for the industry worker at the end of the Kali Yuga here, uh, whose poor fate is simply to be a cog in the machine. He's a servant of the machine and performs the task in a purely quantitative manner that anyone else could do just as well. There's nothing of himself in the process. Uh, so it doesn't matter who does it. Uh, all that matters is who does it quickly. Uh, and quantity becomes the measure of how fast you can do the job and get it done uh, quickly. Um, so we have that opposition in this chapter. But I think that the most interesting of these three chapters is the middle one here when he talks about the two different kinds of anonymity, qualitative anim anonymity and quantitative anonymity. Uh, especially with qualitative anonymity as it is exemplified by the medieval craftsman who is anonymous. Um, we get all this anonymous medieval art, and indeed most traditional art is anonymous, especially if you're looking at something like the history of Hindu sculpture. It's all, we don't know who did any of that stuff. It's all an anonymous works of art. And that attitude of anonymity uh, for the craftsman prevails all the way up through the Middle Ages on down to about the 15th century, where artists start signing their works in the West, and we start to get the individual. Now, this uh, before we get into that, uh, this is polarized against the contemporary quantitative inverse analogy, the mirror image of uh, anonymity, quantitative anonymity in the sense of the worker, uh, the factory worker whose work that he produces is also totally anon uh, anonymous, but it's mass-produced. It's a reiteration of the product, uh, a mass-produced product that could have been produced by anyone. And so it's anonymous in that sense. So we get a degradation at the end of the cosmic cycle. But this idea, I want to stop and focus on this and interject a little uh, sort of footnote into all this uh, about the anonymous craftsman. Um, I remember back when I was studying Joseph Campbell, his mentor was Heinrich Zimmer. And Heinrich Zimmer was the great German Indologist, um, possibly nobody greater than him in the field of Indology, with the exception of the man that he revered, Ananda K. Kumaraswamy, uh, of whom Heinrich Zimmer said was the only man that could give me a genuine inferiority complex. Kumaraswamy knew his stuff, and Zimmer deferred to him very often. And when Heinrich Zimmer died, 
and Campbell took over the editing of his works. Very often, he would uh, be in correspondence with, Zim, with Kumar Swami to have him insert notes, such as in the book Myths and Symbols in Indian Art and Civilization. There are a number of footnotes by Kumar Swami in there. But during that process of editing, of Campbell editing the posthumous works of Zimber, uh, Zimmer, uh, Kumar Swami died, and then uh, so he had to relate to his wife. And so they had a kind of uh, relationship in that sense. But Heinrich Zimmer uh, basically uh, distanced himself from the esoterists because of this idea of the anonymous artist, that they don't, he always felt that the esoterists, and this includes not just uh, people like Kumar Swami, Fritjof Schuen, uh, Rene Ganon, you know, people like this, all, all this sort of group, Titus Burkhardt, the traditionalists who value and vaunt tradition over the individual and see the individual simply as a bearer of a larger tradition that he carries with him uh, or her, in most cases it's, it's going to be a him, in the especially in the traditional uh, world, um, carries this tradition with him and does not dare to modify it. Uh, in Byzantine iconography, there are only certain subjects that the artist is fit to represent. And these I, I've termed iconotypes. This is a term that I found floating around, but applied it specifically in my book, Art After Metaphysics, to this phenomenon of the Byzantine iconotypes that the West inherited. These iconotypes are, uh, we might say that they're universal iconotypes, except that I call them iconotypes to distinguish them from Jungian archetypes, because Archetypes are of the collective unconscious. They are common to the entire human species, like the virgin birth, for instance. You can find that all over the planet, scattered everywhere. It's an archetype of the collective unconscious, no doubt about it. Not so for archetypes which are speci specific to a tradition, which I just call iconotypes, uh, or universal iconotypes within that tradition, such as, in the Christian tradition, the Last Supper, or the Crucifixion, the Ascension of Mary, uh, the beheading of John the Baptist and the dance of Salome. Um, those are iconotypes. They're reiterated over and over and over again. And by the time the artist comes to the field of possibilities, uh, the things that he can paint in the Byzantine tradition, uh, as well as in the Hindu tradition, uh, the things that he can represent are prefixed. So meaning is already prefixed, and the artist is bound to the iconotype. Uh, let's say the Hindu craftsman wants to represent the dancing Shiva. Uh, Shiva Nataraja. So uh, you have this circle, the, the circle surrounding the dancing Shiva uh, with the flame and the drum, uh, the tick of time and the dwarf under his feet and all of that. You can't change any of that as an artist. Uh, you're a bearer, an anonymous craftsman who bears a tradition. You can't interfere with that. You simply have to represent it the way it's been represented. Meaning is pre-established for the artist in that tradition. Same thing in the Byzantine tradition meaning is pre-established with the Christian iconotypes that we then inherited, that migrated to Italy uh, during the Italian Renaissance, and we pick all of this up and they become the primary archetypes of medieval art. And artists generally don't sign their works until you get down to the 15th century and suddenly you get this idea of the artist as a true individuality with Leonardo, Michelangelo, Raphael, Titian, Botticelli. Uh, they just come out of the gate. One great artist after the next and it's at this point that Kumar Swami uh, was said to have drawn the line and said, the West is now an aberration. Uh, it's at that point where the West starts producing these individuals with their own sign regimes, with their own peculiar, unique, and bizarre individual stylizations of the iconotypes. That was too much for Kumar Swami. He left it. And so for him, the Western tradition begins uh, with the Renaissance as an aberration because it's at this point that the artist as a genius, as the individual, walks on stage with Leonardo. And Leonardo then inherits something like the iconotype of the Last Supper. So he inherits this iconotype, and he apotheosizes it with the Last Supper done by him. I don't think anybody ever did it better. Maybe that's arguable, but I don't think anybody did it better. And by the time he apothe by the time an, an iconotype is apotheosized, it becomes semantically depleted. And subsequent practitioners who come in, like, say, Tintoretto's Last Supper, let's say, it's interesting. It's not what Leonardo achieved, though. Uh, same thing with Michelangelo. He apotheosizes uh, the creation of Adam with Yahweh on the uh, Sistine ceiling, creating Adam as the great apotheosis of that iconotype. And after that, it, gets, it just becomes a dying echo. 
So once an iconotype by one of these individualistic artists becomes apotheosized, it then becomes semantically depleted during subsequent generations who then have to transform it. They inherit it and they have to invent new iconotypes. So for instance, the iconotype of the representation of Christ, uh, Pentocrator, uh, the, what D&G called the average white man, Christ with the face, with the eyes that bore into you, uh, that representation eventually gives rise to the portrait study. So you get Albrecht Dürer, for instance, portraying himself, plugging himself into the iconotype of the representation of Christ Pantocrator in his self-portrait, which looks like an ego inflation, but what it is is a transformation of the iconotype into a new iconotype, namely the portrait study. From that point on, from about 1500 on, that's when the portrait study starts coming in with Jan van Eyck and uh, Giovanni Bellini's Doge Lord Dano. Uh, the portrait study comes in now, which replaces the portraits of the saints and the portraits of Christ and so forth. Those iconotypes are semantically depleted. By this point, they die out. We get the portrait study now that comes in, and it goes on all the way down to modernism, which dismantles it. Same thing with infinite space and depth perspective in painting. That's a new iconotype that comes in here uh, during the Renaissance and then gets semantically depleted by the time it's inherited by the Impressionists, who then dismantle it. They carve it up, and it becomes a perspectival space, and the new iconotype becomes the hyperdimensional object. Uh, the object that exists simultaneously in multiple spaces and multiple times, all at the same moment, uh, sort of abstracted from the realm of actual three-dimensional physical space and time. That becomes the iconotype of sort of modernity, of modernist art. So the iconotypes evolve, and they go through these processes. Now, an individual artist, and here's what I think has happened, is that with contemporary art, with an individual artist, you can get someone like Jackson Pollock who comes in and invents a brand new iconotype. He doesn't inherit an iconotype. Pollock, in his case, invents a brand new iconotype that never existed before with the drip paintings. That's a new iconotype. Uh, all his paintings up to that represent an inheritance of the canon of modernist iconotypes, uh, many of which are Jungian archetypes, uh, the shaman, the wolf, the, uh, the animal mother, and the great mother, and so forth. He inherits that, plays around with that for a while, and then by the time he hits the drip paintings, that's a new iconotype. Uh, so now we get the iconotype, not as a universal iconotype, that is to say the artist is a bearer of a pre-existent iconotype that he simply dialogues with, but rather the artist as a creator of an iconotype, a singular iconotype. So this is an iconotype as a singularity created by an artist that becomes part of his own private sign regime. And then so this tendency gets more and more pronounced until you get with contemporary art. Each artist today uh, has his or her own private sign regime with their own internal iconotypes, and none of them match on to each other's. Uh, they all sort of uh, have their own private world islands. They're, they're like sign regimes unto themselves. So this tendency toward individual, individuality that is described, uh, decried by <clears throat> people like Kumar Swami and Titus Burkhardt and uh, Rene Ganon uh, is what the West has been about. It is the great metaphysical revelation and realization of what the West has been about, namely the individual as a species unto himself, as a creator unto him or herself, and as a metaphysical individual, a totally unique singularity with something new to offer. Each artist has something brand new to offer. We don't just inherit iconotypes and transmit them the way the Hindu sculptors did. Uh, you can't interfere with the pre-existent iconotype that you're representing. You simply have to pass it along. This is why we've got the Mahabharata as this vast, sprawling epic, 18 volumes. And the reason it's so long is, because, is precisely because there is no author to it. It's, it's written by many anonymous individuals over many generations who have come along and inserted things and kept inserting things and inserting more and more and more. And the epic just kept swelling with all these anonymous contributions. Uh, so it's, it wasn't written by Vyasa. That's just a convention. That's just an idea. It is an anonymous epic, which is why it's so sprawling and huge. Uh, this isn't the way the West does things. And so Ganon doesn't understand the West. The esotericists don't understand the West. They want to turn the clock back and jump back into the world before the West came along to melt down all the iconotypes and free up their energies. Once you destroy an iconotype, that energy goes somewhere, and it comes out in new and explosive and exciting ways, and you get the West with its idea of artistic evolution as the constant shock of the new. It isn't new in the West if there isn't a shock uh, value as part of it. You know, Caravaggio 
inherits the iconotypes and then he completely dismantles them. And he's the first artist to have this sort of shock value element where the iconotypes are these street thugs that he plugs into them uh, and they're being de deconstructed. You can see the, the Christian iconotypes melting down there in Caravaggio. Uh, so this distinction between uh, qualitative anonymity and quantitative anonymity as the medieval craftsman versus the factory worker is interesting. But I think the problem with Ganon here is precisely this black and white thing that he's got with this metaphysical difference engine where everything is either a pure example of quality or it's a pure example of, of degraded quality as quantity. It's like he's left no room for anything in between there. After all, this is part of a declining cycle that moves from the Krita Yuga to the Trita to the Devapara to the Kali Yuga. I would like to know what the characteristics are in between those two poles of absolute quality in the Krita Yuga and the reign of absolute quantity in the Kali Yuga. What happened to the phases in between? I'd like to know what the seasons are like, uh, not just in spring and in winter, but what about summer and autumn? Uh, what kinds of characteristics uh, can we assign to society and the arts and so forth within in those intervening periods? So instead, he sort of flattens all this out to just a simple black and white discussion where every example that he gives is either simply the reign of quantity or an excellent example of uh, something in which quality predominates. So that would be my critique of uh, Gennon.